So our next speaker, and I'm conscious we're running out of time, uh, is, a, is a, a man uh, who I think for 11 years or so I've been publishing, he's been one of the, the, the leading voices in uh, water and, and wastewater uh, in Ireland. Um, it's Charles Burns from, from Kingspan. Um, he's talking today on solar thermal water conservation drainage and fuel storage requirement. And uh, he's over 15 years in technical sales and consulting expertise in the sustainable water, renewable energy, and environmental fuel storage aspects of the Kingspan environmental business. Water and energy cost saving solutions, as well as wastewater disposal, have been recognised as, as a major concern for Ireland's environmental, economic, and legislative decision makers. And these are the, the key areas that Charles manages and advises on a daily and strategic basis. So, over to Charles. Thank you, Jeff. Kingspan Environmental. As Jeff said, unfortunately, I have been talking about water harvesting and uh, the treatment of, of uh, sewage for a long time. Sometimes as a lonely voice. Uh, there are some people in this room I've seen over the years, and uh, I'm really glad to get this opportunity from Alan and the team Heat Merchants to kind of give everyone a bit of a, an update on where, where we are and what we see is happening in the industry. Uh, unlike uh, most people, Kingspan are not just an insulation or a panels company. We actually have an environmental range of products. We are the, the European leader in wastewater management and rainwater harvesting management in Europe. Uh, we don't unfortunately have a very significant business in Ireland because the building regulations, as we know, or the, the finances don't allow for it. But with the instigation of new water rates, I think this is becoming much more to the fore. So, what I'd like to talk, talk about, first of all, is sewage treatment systems. <clears throat> Not the sexiest topic in the world, but unfortunately everyone has to flush the toilet. Uh, some of which you, we, you might know our brand, which is called Clarchester. Sewage, as you look at the site assessment, the regulations, the code of practice, uh, I see some members of the audience here will be very instigative in what's happening in the codes of practice and the new SR66. We want to talk about the size of the treatment plant, what treatment plants you want to go for, and typical installation. Okay, first one I want to talk about here is what, what decisions do you have to make? You're choosing about sewage. The first and the easiest, and unfortunately not good for our business, is connect to the mains. If you can connect to the mains, always connect to the mains. It's the easiest solution, it's the most cost effective solution, and ultimately it's Irish Water's challenge, but not your clients. The next is, is first of all, you go by gravity, the next you go by a pumping station. So always we would, we would advise go first to the mains. The next is a septic tank. Uh, Eamon Smith in the, in the crowd here might necessarily agree with that, Eamon, but the easiest is, is to go with a septic tank, we believe, and then to go to a sewage treatment plant. 
For those who don't know, the sewage treatment plant is a higher treatment efficiency than a septic tank. A septic tank simply separates solids and, and uh, liquid. The sewage treatment plant will treat the liquid. It will treat the solids, but it will treat the liquid. And uh, <clears throat> the last, but not least, is a sealed cesspool where there is no discharge in the environment. We've only seen that in very, very, very tight uh, standards. We've never seen it in Ireland, but we see it in the continent, particularly in the Channel Islands in the UK, where there's complete uh, groundwater protection, so you cannot discharge sewage into the environment. We have not seen that in Ireland, and we hope not to. Okay, so if you want to connect the mains by pumping, obviously everyone knows how, how we can connect by gravity. So you've got to correct the, you've got to choose the pumping station is critical, as our friends from Foss would advise us from time to time. Okay, we would strongly advise that you put in 24 hours of storage. We find that stations are going into the ground where people don't allow for a problem. If the electricity goes off, very, very quickly the sun fills up and you get a back log up into the house. So in the UK, the regulations say 24 hours and we advise that as a, as a very good practice going forward. So as a specifier, what do you need to tell us so we can help you? You need the volume of waste. That's driven how many people are in the house. You know the type of waste, is it just sewage? Uh, and if it's just sewage, we can give a pretty good idea of what the outputs are every day. Surface water is different. Surface water, depending on the size of the property, the size of the roof, what's the hard standing area, what are you draining into the pump? How far do you want to pump it? What's the total height, total head, and the in-depth of the sewer? What's the diameter of the rising gain? That's quite important because <clears throat> Clearly, the, the operation of the pump is highly, highly influenced by what's the diameter in the rising main. Lots of people buy pumping stations and then they work out only on site how am I going to connect this to the main, to the main sewer. It's not advisable. You should know the size of the pumping main before you choose your pumping station. <clears throat> on the power supply, there is three phase or single phase. And to one solids handling our grinder. <clears throat> We're finding in different markets in Europe. Grinder pumps are now being banned for sewage. The reason why that's happening is that the water authorities are finding it much harder to treat grinded sewage than actually solid sewage. It's easier for them to treat solid sewage. Okay, so let's talk about a treatment plant or a septic tank. Septic tank, as you can see, is that this is in the top property. You typically need a bigger uh, area to, for drainage purposes. Some in the room may disagree, but our, our ex significant experience would say you do need a bigger percolation area and if you have a treatment plant. Uh, because the treatment, the, the percolation area for a septic tank is both involved in the discharge of the water but also in additional treatment. Within a treatment plant, you treat more in the tank. So you don't need as much treatment in the percolation field. Okay, so as you, as you can see here, we've got to follow the code of practice. Okay, what, what have we got in place at the moment? We've got the, the, the code of practice for 2009 for domestic systems. We have quite an old one, 99 for commercial systems and small communities. <clears throat> and then we have our beloved European standard. Don't laugh at him, please. Uh, the European standard has been a very a tortuous journey of trying to get some kind of uh, coordinated action across the, the, the EU and we have got to this point. Is this is this the perfect situation? No, but this is where we are. The key thing that really affects us in Ireland here is part one, part three. What the, what the European standard will tell you is what products, <coughs> how they have to perform. They don't tell you what the performance the criteria are. What it says is this is how you measure how the product performs. You then choose the product as a specifier and the performance of the product. And then part H and the very, very recent SR66, which isn't quite in, in operation yet. Okay, SR66 and part H. SR66 gives us guidance in the selection of wastewater treatment plants in Ireland. As I say, there's some in the room here who have been instrumental in bringing this into the fore. So it gives guidance on the minimum performance required on units to tie with the European standard. Of parts 1, 3, 4 and 6, but the primary parts here are part 1 and 3 in Ireland. It gives us guidance and scaling and such capacity. 
all test certifications must show the following results as you can see. Water tightness, tells the structural behaviour. We have seen, as I'm sure some of you have seen, we have seen tanks in the field have failed, collapsed. That, that tends to be because people haven't, uh, particularly for GRP, where people have not built a tank uh, for 20 year life cycle. We have found tanks uh, where people have put wooden and timber bracing inside the tank, sold the tank, and then it, naturally the wood has failed and the tank has collapsed. The European standard now prevents that. As long as you buy a European product with a European certificate, it should absolutely tell you that it's past structural efficiency. Durability. The test in, in, in Europe, uh, the, the biggest test house is just on the, on the German Belgian border. It goes on for about 40 weeks. It's a very, very, very intensive test. Treatment efficiency, 99.5%. And also, uh, something that's very close to people's hearts here is the sludge volume. How often do you have to empty a tank? That is a very big issue. Lots of people have very cost effective tanks. The issue being, how often do you have to desludge it? Every three months, every six months, every year. And the treatment plant, part three and six, you must <coughs> tell how many desludges are going to be through the test period. We have found, again, it's all in detail. The European standard does not tell you what to do. It only informs you what the test results tell you. It will be then up to you as the specifier to decide what you choose. The devil's in the detail. The devil's in the detail. Unfortunately, it's not just a black and white case. Uh, you can either come to us and we'll advise you, or others will advise you, but you have to look at the detail. Just because someone's got a European standard does not mean it's the optimum solution for your client. And obviously, the electric consumption. We've seen some products, uh, particularly from Eastern Europe, where electricity appears to be extremely inexpensive, with a very, very, very high power consumption. As you move towards Western Europe, as Scott was saying earlier, electricity is not cheap. It may be cheap with PV, but it's not, the, it's not cheap from the grid. And performance, our beloved performance, 20, 30, 20. That's the standard, this has been the standard since the initial SR6, and that routine remains the standard. Okay. Okay, the code of practice for small houses, less than 10 people. Okay. If you can't connect to the mains, you have to comply with this code of practice. Okay? It's a very, <coughs> the standard is it doesn't affect your health. <coughs> uh, we should also have, as you can see, the, the classic site assessment with the site assessor. We also need to take into account the European standard, as I said before. And we also must meet the new SR66. So you must comply. With, it, with a product that complies with the European standard and also complies with SR66, which is, as I said, only very recent. Site assessment, what has to happen on the site assessment? Can a site <coughs> take actually the effluent from an, an off main system? As many of you would know, during the, the boom times uh, in the early 2000s, there were lots of houses built in places they shouldn't be built. Uh, I know one particular area where there was about 50 houses built in a bog and the people cannot discharge from their septic tanks so they, they couldn't flush their toilets after a while because the ground water table had gone so high they actually couldn't discharge it they should never have got planning for the houses never in the first place but the land was cheap and uh, maybe we weren't uh, <clears throat> as aware as we are now of the problems okay we should test the ground levels as everyone knows uh, in, affordance, in accordance with the 2009 code of practice. Commencement notice, as usual, I, I don't want to go through some of the details here, I want to know a lot of these things, but the three key factors need to be considered. Are there any restrictions? Are you too close to your neighbours? Are you too close to any places where there's quite specific requirements? Is the site able to treat wastewater? Can you attenuate it? Can you get rid of the wastewater off your site? As last way I said, our Advice is, if you can get it back to the mains, get it back to the mains. It's far easier that way than treating it on a site. Because you don't, you don't give yourself attenuation problems, you don't give yourself high water table problems, things like that. So if you can, get it back to the mains. It's not good for our business, but it's the best thing to do. And can you get rid of the wastewater volumes? Okay. 
Okay. You have to do desktop study. You need a, your on-site assessment. What does it involve? It involves a, a visual assessment. You take a trial hole. You look at the structure, you look at the mass characteristics, you look at the bedrock and the water table. You've got to see where the water is going to go to. You do your classic perk test. What's going to happen? Can the soil take the hydraulic load or can it not? Okay. Next, you go through, you look at what's happened to the data and what does it tell you? What does it tell you? Can you discharge into that site or can you not? That's I would assume most people understand and have been involved, if they haven't done this themselves, they know many other professionals who do this. It's quite an easy test, it's quite straightforward, but it's important to do it correctly. But the one thing I would say is, in our experience, don't fool yourself with the results. If the results are what they are, they're telling you that you need to think again about where you're going to site the wastewater system and how you're going to get rid of the, the hydraulic load. If it doesn't work, you need to think. You can't just ignore it. Pretend it's not there. You must think about it. Because once you start flushing the toilet, that's when the real problem starts. But at that stage, the problems are very, very, very deep. Okay, how are you going to get rid of the, not the sewage, it's actually the water, it's not the sewage, the problem here, the problem is always the hydraulic load. And what are you going to do? <clears throat> uh, where are you going to site it? Well, you, can, you can actually solve a lot of our hydraulic problems depending on where you sign the product. Uh, and I would, what I would say is that for ourselves at Kingspan, we can absolutely advise people where is best to sign a product on the site. Because you can put the product on the wrong place. You can on the right side, just put the product in the wrong place. Therefore, you can't get rid of the, the, the hydraulic load. <coughs> and then you fill, your, the, fill the form in, the map and everything. Standard procedure into, into plan. There's your site characteristic form. You may or may not be familiar with it. <clears throat> it's fairly straightforward. Anyone who's done percolation tests will know how that works. I'll not go through the very detail, but this is how you, this is how you fill the form in different parts. Okay. Probably the biggest challenge of everyone is how to design it, uh, the percolation area. How to do it. How you're going to get it to work and how you're going to get it to comply with the different requirements. In the past, we have seen different councils take very, very, very different approaches to how these are done from some very expensive solutions with raised mounds, with imported soil, to some people who have completely ignored it and, and taken the, the pipe to the ditch. And as long as you get it away from your site, you're a happy man. Unfortunately, it's true, Eamon, I know, but it's true. It's true. Uh, it's a very, very important issue here. The, the, the tank is one thing, but the, the, the whole percolation system and the tank, it's one system. You choose the tank carefully, but you need to put the percolation area in correctly. And the percolation area is very much driven by your, uh, the percolation results of the drum. And again, your, 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 your advisors can help, or else you know, we, can, we can certainly help what would be a solution, post-solution. But ultimately, it would be the uh, professionals who will sign it off. You can see, we're looking here at geotextile, we're looking at different types of stone. Uh, also in the pipe, we have seen people on sites put in land drainage pipe. And it, crushes, it just crushes, so all of a sudden the septic tank doesn't work. The septic tank doesn't work, why not? Because the pipe's been crushed. Crazy stuff, absolutely crazy stuff. Just takes a very small bit of attention, just at the, at the, top, at the point of building we find. The geotextile clearly protects the, the installation. On the top soil. What we, what, in our experience, we would say the percolation area is easy to do, but you just got to be careful how you do it. It can't be just ignored. It can't be throw a couple of lines of pipe into the ground, put a bit of stone around it, and off you go. I'm sure nobody in the room would do that, but that's what might happen at times. Okay, our latest amendment in 2014. So we all have to have an assigned assessor before the commencement of the project. Okay. It'll be the responsibility of that certifier to give a certificate of compliance, as we all know. That certifier will use other certifiers to help ancillaries, professionals, okay? And, that, and particularly for our area, they'll be looking at uh, the code of practice and the current building regulations. Ancillary certifiers, uh, <clears throat> they can supply uh, certification of them to the primary certifier. 
okay, what are you looking for in, in terms of uh, certification? You need to be looking for for your treatment plant, you'll be looking for your percolation area, and the installation of them both. Okay, depending on how, how you work with your, your advisor, you can either have an installation certification for either, or combine the both. We're seeing different practices. Okay, sizing a sewage treatment plant. Domestic dwellings, it's 150 litres per person per day. Uh, we assume a 60 grams of BOD, which is the strength of the sewage, and we assume ammonia level of 8. Okay, what we're talking about, we're talking about probably from toilets, we're talking from baths, kitchen waste, uh, <clears throat> and to, uh, all domestic sewage. That is a standard we use across the place. We don't change it, because uh, you couldn't change it. You cannot uh, uh, do it for each house, unlike our tightness, where you can do it for each house. We assume certain standards, and that's assumed actually in quite a few countries across Europe. And the same with the way there at the bottom. Commercial waste is slightly different. Okay, you've got to look at where it's coming from. Is it coming from toilets? Is it coming from kitchens? Is it coming from manufacturing? Is it seasonal? We would find, for example, with race courses, race courses would have very, very, very different requirements for sewage treatment as compared to a bar or restaurant. If you go, uh, primarily because a race course might only open for 20 weekends a year. So it gets a huge hydraulic load, a huge biological hit for two or three days, and then nothing happens for a month. That's quite difficult to do, but you can specify it, you can design it, but you need to know that before you do it. Okay, and the EPA in, in its guidance gives us flows of loads, so it actually tells us for all these different applications what parameters you need to do, what assumptions you need to do to size these. Again, what we can do is if, if we get the different information, we can size up the product, we can tell you this is what you need to do. Okay, selection. Okay, what things do you need to consider? Okay. Is it domestic, is it commercial? What is the standard? Is there, special st is there a high standard? For example, if you go to areas particularly where the fisheries are involved, you will get some quite high standards of discharge. But typically it's 20, 30, 20. We're looking for ammonia reduction, we're looking for phosphate reduction, total N. Uh, Total end is something we have seen in certain sites in Ireland. It's very driven by local councils. It's extremely difficult to get. Where you're trying to reduce the total nitrogen coming out of the product, very, very, very difficult and very expensive to do correctly. Some people we find in the past will say they can achieve it, uh, but when you go back and test it afterwards, there may be some challenges around it. Okay, what planning extensions are there? Are there very, are there very low flows? As I say, we have found in social flows, in, in religious centres, race courses, you will get very, very, very low flows at certain times of the year, which will cause significant problems when trying to size the product. Here's a typical installation in a very dry Irish site, Scott. The, uh, this is actually midsummer for us. Uh, you can see it's quite significant when you're putting in some commercial systems, what you're talking about. You can see the large base here. The base has got to go in. It really doesn't matter what the ground conditions are to stop the product from popping up on the water table. So you can see the anchor points in the base. We actually strap the tank to the anchor points to try to keep the tank down. Even though it's a tank and it could be filled with 80 cubic water, the tank will still go up, pop up with the water table. So you've got to anchor the product down. We, we have seen a lot of people put into where they put a treatment plant or something in during the summer where the water table is very low. Everyone thinks it's a very simple installation. Everyone forgets what it's going to be like in January. You need to put the base in, you need the product protected so the groundwater will not pull it off the ground. And that does happen quite a lot, particularly in the, the, the Midlands and the West. Okay, what do you need to consider about insulation? You don't want rainwater in the system. If you put rainwater in the system, you're going to massage the system. Okay, is there a requirement for pumps? You, you don't have to have your percolation area inside your tank. You can have the percolation area at a totally different part of the garden, the property, and you can pump it away. What if, <clears throat> is it raw sewage? Do you, want to, do you want to go pump directly into the plant, or do you want to pump it directly? Do you want to treat the sewage away from the system? How deep do you want the tank? 
Where do you want the tank? Where do you want the discharge into the percolation area? Is there a requirement for a grease trap, particularly in commercial properties? Grease will kill the biology within a tank, so you need to protect the tank from grease. Whichever tank it is, whether it's Kingspan tank or England's tank, keep grease out of the bottom. And make sure you follow the installation guidelines. What to avoid? Don't put rainwater in. We do have quite a lot of it, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Chemical toilet waste and carbon parts. Keep it out of it, because it kills the biology. Because what we have in these tanks is we have biology. Waste disposal units, grease and cooking oils, oils, weed killers, insecticides, fungicides. We actually had one client whose treatment plant didn't work, and we had a deep investigation into why. We found out he was actually processing photographs in his garage, and he was using the chemicals for the photographs and pouring it down his treatment plant. And I was wondering why his treatment plant didn't work. Not something that science had for specified it for. Medicines, there we go. My friend with the photograph developing agents is quite popular. I don't know why, but it's quite popular. <laughs> now, be sanitary towels, keep them out of it because all we do is simply block up the tank. <clears throat> Rags and tall toys. We have found a lot of people, particularly it happened in Kildare, where we have people moving out of central Dublin to try to, to live in the countryside. They built a lovely big house in the countryside in Kildare, but they thought they were still in Dublin, so they just flushed everything down the toilet. What they then found out was that the toilet ended up 30 yards outside the back door. So there's all kinds of things we were finding in, in, in some of the tanks. This is not applicable to Ireland, by the way. This is more applicable to uh, our German friends, but they do, do, do like to make a lot of beer. And cleaning agents. So basically, keep it all out of the tank. Keep the tank just with sewage. If you keep it with sewage, the tank will work. Uh, as long as you follow the processes, the tanks will work. A lot of the ghost stories, a lot of the bad stories about sewage treatment is bad practice. Bad practice. It's not that the products, but the percolation is just bad practice. So the second part of my presentation, I just want to talk about real water harvesting. As Jeff said, this is probably a topic <clears throat> that I was out on. I was out very early on, Jeff. Long before people were talking about it, we as kids, we said that we think this is going to be a really, really big issue. This is our home market. Uh, and it's just taken a long time for everyone to realise that we do have a problem. Whether we should be charged for it or not, I know it's not for me to comment on. But I just want to talk about what are the issues and what are the solutions, particularly for you as designers. Okay. What's our water challenge? What's our legislative requirements? How do you design it? And what products should you, what do we advise that you should think about? procuring or specifying. What's our challenge? We've got lots of rain. We have lots and lots of rain. And everyone thinks because it falls from the sky, it is very, very easy to clean it and get it back to your tap. If you don't have the infrastructure and you haven't spent the money on the infrastructure in the last 20 years, or 50 years, it's really, really expensive. I know nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to fund it. But it is really, really expensive. And every other country in Europe has had the same problem. The difference is they have been putting together an infrastructure for 40 years in Europe, probably since the war. We have a lot of catching up to do. We have an awful lot of catching up to do. Okay, Dublin's short of water, hard to believe, but actually Dublin, as I showed in the next slide, is actually the driest part of Ireland. It may not feel that way, but Dublin's the driest part of Ireland, <laughs> and we don't have enough water falling from the sky in Dublin, and we don't have the ability to collect it. So we have a supply and storage problem. Dublin has grown significantly more than was planned. Uh, or if it was planned, we didn't plan for the water infrastructure. So the cost of development is going to be extremely high. There's so always been a huge political debate over this. But the reality is Dublin doesn't have enough water. So what is the solution? We all love water meters. So we're putting water meters in. That uh, will have some effect upon usage, but we don't believe uh, it will have a huge effect upon usage. What we believe what people need to do is people need to think about how can they reduce not only consumption, but how can they replace the water they buy from our ice water with the free water that falls on your roof. Very, very simple. No different than PV. No different than PV. If you can generate it yourself cost effectively, we absolutely advocate you should do it. <clears throat> Okay, 
can see some of the issues with <clears throat> so most people think for example with real water <coughs> the issue is uh, we can't get enough drinking water we, oh, we all know what happened in, in, in Cork we all know what happened in, in, in the Midlands attenuation <coughs> stormwater attenuation is a huge issue because what we're doing is we're not controlling the water that's coming off our buildings it's hitting hard standing areas and it's heading into a, a drainage system that cannot cope so for example in London, we did a scheme in London, in central London, in the borough of Chelsea, where we took the rainwater off roofs and we stored it in tanks all around Chelsea because they had a very, very big bad flooding, flooding problem. They couldn't increase the size of the, the, the stormwater sewers, so they actually put stormwater attenuation above ground all across Chelsea. And if you ever drive around in Chelsea, just look at for big blue Kingspan tanks. They're dotted all around the back of the buildings where they're taking the rainwater off the roof and they're just storing it for a while and then they're letting it go into the mains. So, <clears throat> where's flooding? Flooding is really affected. It's not by agricultural land, it's large, hard air, hard standing areas. Obviously we have global warming, we have significantly changed rainfall patterns. Absolutely rainwater harvesting will alleviate that. In Kingspan Panels, one of our other divisions, we are, we are seeing a lot of large sheds now putting rainwater harvesting in because when you put a hard shed or a large shed in, you put a large hard standing area, you're actually creating an attenuation problem. So we can solve both problems with that. So for example, if you put uh, siphonic drainage in on a, on a roof, siphonic drainage simply gets the water off the roof quicker. The question is, where does the water go? If you put it straight into a storm sewer and the storm sewer is not sized correctly, you'll have a flood. It'll just back up. Okay, rainfall in Ireland. It's hard to believe, but we get less than 800 million Dublin of rainwater. That's quite similar to significant parts of, the, of England, the south of England. Admittedly, if you go to Belmullet, or you go near Clifton, it's a little bit wetter. Our problem is our population's on the east coast, and the rainfall all falls on the west coast. If we could somehow move the rainfall over to Dublin for a couple of months during the winter, it would be a lot better. But the rain is falling in the from, a, from a, a macro perspective, the rain is falling in the wrong place and we don't have the infrastructure to move it across the country. Or we might, but it's going to cost us a lot of money. So, I don't know whether that's a surprise. A lot of people were certainly surprised to us when we pulled it out about 10 years ago. The Dublin's extremely dry. It doesn't feel like it, but it is. So, where, where's legislation? Again, I'm not talking about, I'm not going to talk about the do's and don'ts are the rights and wrongs of charging for water, but here's where we are on legislation. Obviously, Dublin, we have the uh, SUDS policy. The SUDS policy has been there. Dublin was, was really ahead of the game very, very early on, seeing that actually rainwater or stormwater was going to cause a flooding problem in Dublin. We clearly had flooding problems in certain parts of Dublin, and, and the, the County Council issued very, very, very early guidance as part of the development plan. And as part of that, it's the, the construction of green roofs, rainwater harvesting, detention basins, ponds and wetlands, anywhere that we can store water and slow down water getting into the, the storm sewer is a benefit. Okay. <clears throat> County Cork, they've also caught, caught up with Dublin. Uh, some would say they're ahead of them, some would say they're behind them. Rainwater harvesting provides a significant opportunity to take storm water out of the storm network and that's the key issue is to get water out of the storm network. The storm network is not big enough. It's simply not big enough. We have seen developments in the UK where the development has been turned down because the storm network is not up to taking the hydraulic load that's going to come off a new hard standing area. So the developer either has to improve the storm network or he needs to stop or slow down the, 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 the hydraulic load going to the storm sewer. Okay, the dangerous slide as I call it, the cost of water. We're all going to pay four euro eighty eight for water. That's the third highest in Europe. You pay for water going in at two euro forty four, but you also pay for the water going out. Okay, and if you think about that on rainwater on rainwater harvesting, what the rainwater harvesting will do, the rainwater harvesting will lower the cost of water going in, but it won't lower the cost of going out. The, the, the price of water at the moment is, is, in Ireland is very expensive across Europe. 
The only country we can see is more expensive is Germany. And Germany has the biggest rainwater harvesting industry in Europe. The reason why is because it's financially very, very beneficial in Europe, in Germany. In Germany, you can get a payback nearly 40 years on the domestic system. So it's worthwhile people doing it. So the government has set the tariff very high. Okay, there's lots of allowances for it, uh, and how that proceeds through the, through the next number of administrations, we're not sure. But the key thing here is the price of water is very high in Ireland. We won't pay it all at the, initially because of all the allowances, but the, the price per cubic metre is uh, expensive. So what we're advocating, people particularly on you build, the designers should be thinking about this now to try to future-proof their buildings. One from an energy perspective, from an air tightness perspective, from an electrical perspective, but also from a water perspective. We think the water, the water will become the new energy. You know? Because clearly, as Mark said, there's been a lot of good work done on energy and trying to lower the energy footprint of houses. Nobody's thinking about water. Oh, we are. Okay, how to design a system? It's quite simple. How you design a system? Here's a form that, that we have devised. What we need is we need the roof area in square meters. The roof is the yield. Approximately, if you take on average across Ireland, it's about one cubic meter per square meter of roof. If you have a 100 square meter roof, you're going to yield 100 cube of water. Okay, we're looking for the usage. That's very simple, particularly on domestic household. Application in the domestic household, how many users, location of the rainfall data. For example, if you have, if you have a house, a summer house in Belmont, you will have a tremendous yield of your rainwater harvesting system. You might not much of a summer holiday, but you'll certainly have tremendous yield from your rainwater harvesting. What's the cost of water? As I said, the cost of water coming in now is very expensive, and it's actually going to make the payback for rainwater harvesting very attractive in Ireland. Very attractive. Have you an area for installation on new build? The tank goes below the ground. You can use a polyethylene tank, you can use a GRP tank, or a concrete tank. You're just looking for a tank. The key thing here is actually the control systems on top of that. Do you use a gravity system or a pump system? New build retrofit. I would openly say now the new build business, it's significantly easier to install a real water harvesting system on a new build. Significantly easier than a retrofit. On a new build, you can get it deeply into the fabric of the building. On a retrofit, it's much more difficult. Much more difficult. So, from a, from a designer perspective, we believe people should be thinking about it from a new build perspective. Okay, where's the guidance documents? Okay, we have a British standard, which we do take cognizance of here. We have RAS, and we also have Part H. Uh, we also have, a, it's best practice within the building regulations at the moment to install rainwater harvesting systems. We're seeing a lot of that in public buildings, but we're not seeing that in private dwellings because it's only best practice, it's not mandatory. Okay, system solutions. Believe it or not, it's actually quite, quite easy to install a rainwater harvesting system. Do you want a gravity system? A gravity system is you go from the tank, the rainwater comes off the roof, down into the tank, below the ground, you then pump it up into a header tank, uh, a traditional header tank, and you let it fall by gravity into, into the, uh, the different applications. Okay, we have three stage filters. You have the rainwater tank. So, for example, if the rainwater is full, <coughs> we can switch between me, if the, sorry, if the rainwater tank is empty, we can switch between using rainwater and mains water. That's an automatic switchover. We have a submersible pump, uh, a ground false pump. Uh, you can, we advocate going into the header tank because what the header tank can give you, the header tank can give you leeway, for example, if you have a power outage, if you have a power outage in the house, you want some capacity in the roof space. If you have capacity in the roof space, you will still have rainwater to flush your toilets. But remember, rainwater is not for potable consumption. We advocate rainwater only for toilets, for washing machines, and for external use. Now, in a domestic house, that will give you about 55% of your usage. So you will have your water bill if you put a rainwater harvesting system in. We as Kingspan, we don't advocate, nor do we offer a portable solution. Portable solution, we believe, for a domestic application is quite onerous in terms of care, and attention, and maintenance. So we only advocate at the moment uh, uh, non portable solutions. But again, that's 55% of your usage, quite significant. And the next is the direct system. We take the, the water 
from the, of the roof into the tank and then you pump it straight to the application. We see less of that happening now. We prefer to go into a header tank solution, but it all depends on the design of the building. Do you have space for a header tank? That will be, that will be up for the designers to, to advise. Okay. So again, we have a three-stage filter. Uh, submersible pump. If the tank is low, it switches over to the mains. Uh, we, we use a tongue dish to make sure there's no mix between the two feeds. So it's RAS compliant. Uh, we already sell quite a few products, I and mean, lots of people sell products like these here in the market. The key thing is for you to decide do you want to go gravity or direct. We advocate gravity. Commercial systems. We can do, and everyone else can do, between 6,000 6, litres and 80,000 litres. Integrated uh, integral leaf filters, that's as part of the tank. We can design it basically whatever people want. We can have booster sets, depending if it's a high rise building. Pump sets. They are absolutely designed one off at a time. Every building is different, as you all know. But again, it's very, very easy to do. We just give us the inputs and we can design it. Okay, who's involved in this process? Well, we believe we're at the centre of it, where we believe we're with a knowledge expert, but we need the architect, we need the contractor. The supply chain, the manufacturers involved, the m &E consultant, particularly in commercial buildings, and the civil consultant. There are all people who are part of this here. We have found in the past some people, particularly in commercial applications, are, if you do not involve everyone within that circle, you're not going to get the solution. You take, particularly with a civil contractor, a civil contractor will take the tank, he'll put the tank into the ground, but he doesn't really want anything to do with the, the box of m and &E. as, as the guy has told me. So we need to make sure that the M&E and, &E and the, the civil contractors are all on the same page, what we're trying to do, put it into the building. Okay, last but not, not least is, so I've talked about wastewater, I've talked about rainwater, now I want to talk about hot water. Uh, Kingspan, we are the, the, the only, there's only two solar tube manufacturers in Europe, there's one in Germany and there's ourselves up in Northern Ireland. This is all under the brand that we have called Kingspan Solar, or some people might know it as Thermomax. We bought the business about 10 years ago, uh, and it's now an integrated part of our solutions. Okay, what I want to talk about, no different than Scott talked about, when is solar effective? What are the types of collectors, what's the applications, and legislation on our grants, and our grants are. Okay. Uh, as part of the, the, the 10 kilowatts that Mark talked about earlier, it's part of the renewable energy source. It's a sustainable source. We do have more light or more uh, irradiated heat here than we think we have. Uh, and solar thermal, particularly in Ireland and Northern Europe, our product suits that because of its high efficiency. Why you use solar? I think everyone here knows what this is about. It's non-polluting, it's sustainable, uh, and it also gets us compliance with the current building regulations. Why use solar? Economic. Uh, electricity will become more expensive, no doubt about it. Uh, the price of solar doesn't change, well nobody's charging us for the sun yet. Maybe a, a new administration might try to charge us for rainwater in the sun, but not yet. And the legislation, everything's moving towards trying to be more sustainable and more renewable. Is it viable in Ireland? As Scott said, solar is viable in Ireland, whether you're making electricity from it or you're heating your water. We have a good uh, supply of sun, believe it or not, and it's, a, it's equivalent to about 130 litres of oil per year, which is the, the, the free sunlight. Now, I probably shouldn't be admitting that, but I'm responsible also for the oil tank business in Kingspan. Uh, but we think that solar thermal and oil are a good mix with the, with the current building regulations. Okay, what's the system? You have a solar collector. Whether it's a flat plate or whether it's a tube system. You have your pump station, you have your uh, hot water storage, boiler and your flow, your controllers and your expansion vessels. Uh, I'm not sure how many components we have. I know Scott said he's about 50 within a PV system. I'm not sure how many, but again, it's a combined system. And what we find particularly, and I think 
our, our advice to, to uh, uh, specifiers is we find that people are not specifying the entire system. They're specifying the solar thermal, but they're not specifying the tank curve level. We're finding the tanks, the, the hot water tank, is actually being undersized sometimes for the solar collector. We've got to make sure that those things are joined up. We're finding people are buying 30, 30, uh, three square meters of solar thermal and they're bringing a 200 liter tank. It doesn't make sense. You're, you're actually creating too much energy for the tank. So that's just something we need to, we would advise everyone just to watch for. And that tends to be because the tank is being specified by the miller or the plumber. So just be careful. Okay, what factors affect the solar thermal system? There's a difference between the collector facing south and the collector facing west is about 20%. North is about 50%. So it's very similar to what Scott said. If it's, if it's, uh, the, if it's east west, that's not as big an issue as it is north. It doesn't have to be south facing. Uh, the inclination, we, you, can put a, you can put a collector at 90 degrees, a flat will only get 20%. We prefer to getting up to around about 35 degrees. Okay, the larger the area, the more solar available, no different than PV, but don't oversize the system. You oversize the system, you're actually going to create too much heat. Uh, and because it's a closed loop system, you need to deal with the heat somehow. So you need to be quite careful, don't oversize it. And we can help you, we can help you with a commercial building, domestic building, we can size it, but oversizing a solar thermal system is not advisable at all. Again, the larger the cylinder, the, the better the thermal store. Unlike the battery for PV, we do have a, a battery. It's called a, a, a hot tank or a stainless tank. So we would advocate the bigger the tank, the better, because then you can collect as much of the energy, you can keep as much energy as you can. But unfortunately, what we're seeing is we're seeing plumbers put in small tanks, 200 litre tanks. It's, it's, it's not efficient for the system. Okay, how to size the system? What's the hot water requirement? That's driven primarily about how many people in the house. Okay, you need to calculate how much volume you need to store. That's something to say. It's something we're finding people are forgetting about a lot. And uh, they're specifying it, but they're then the actual practice is the the plumber may not be putting in what's, what's exactly required. What size of area do you need? So in a domestic house, it's either typically two square meters or three square meters. On a commercial building, it can be all kinds of size, depending on what you're looking for. What's the roof area and what's the collector layout? Is it east, west, is it south? Uh, and you need it, what's the pitch on the roof? And then we'll select the size for you and we'll tell you what components you require. Collector types. Flat plate vacuum tubes. Uh, we offer both. We, we, we manufacture the tubes and uh, we have a supply arrangement for flat plate. The tubes are made in Northern Ireland. <coughs> flat plate collectors. Okay, two, two systems, the rice system, the serpentine system. I'm not going to go into detail about it. <clears throat> but you can see with flat plate, you can put a flush into the roof or on the roof with brackets. It's very, very similar to PV in, in terms of its look. Okay, probably what, what, what I want to talk a little bit more about is, is the vacuum tubes. The difference between the vacuum tube primarily and, and, and the uh, flat plate is performance, 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 performance. Uh, and, and we can help you with this here with uh, your deep calculations to give you the right orientation to make your, your uh, renewable 10 kilowatt requirement. I'm not going to go through the detail of the product now because I'm sure some of you have already seen it, but the key thing is, is that it is our strong belief that a solar thermal system, if you're, if you're putting one in, you should put it in with a tube plate or a tube because of its, uh, of its efficiency. <coughs> Okay, there's two types. Uh, we have a, uh, a heat pipe and a direct flow. The product here, the key thing here is, that is, is the vacuum area inside the tank, or inside the tube, sorry. The vacuum area, what you'll find in some lesser products is the vacuum area, and the vacuum will deteriorate over time. We give a 20 year guarantee on the product. And that's very, very important. As Scott said at PV, these products are on your roof and they're staying on your roof. Most people will never go back to see what its performance. We will give a 20 year performance guarantee. The product will work as good as it did, the day it's put up, as long as nobody's hit it with uh, something very sharp. So we stand by our product. It's a classic Kingspan product. We will stand by it. And if it doesn't work or something is wrong, 
we will do everything in our powers to help. Okay, tube collectors, as I said, with heat pipes, we have a, a, a unique thermal limitation device. You can put it, as you can see, you can put it vertically, you can put it horizontally, it all depends. We tend to find that Ireland has been quite traditional in how it puts, but you can see in the, in, particularly in London, on the continent, they do go for, go for more vertical looks, particularly in the south facing building. For direct flow. <coughs> What's the advantages of a heat pipe or of a, of a flat plate offer? It's low cost. Absolutely, it's very, very easy to get into the roof, particularly the in roof solution, and it looks flush. What's the disadvantage? It really, its performance isn't, isn't as good as a, as a tube collector. That if you do have high wind, it could, it, you need to be quite careful that the wind doesn't get below the collector and, to, and, and you can actually lift it off the roof, it's not secure in the roof. <coughs> the glass and absorber can get dirty and it will affect performance. And, and higher volume content is equated to larger component sizes. So as you increase the size of the system, everything gets bigger very, very quickly and it's not efficient in lower light. So what you'll find is you find a lot of flat plate product is very suitable for the Mediterranean, places like this, where there's lots and lots and lots of direct light. As you move to Northern Europe, the difference is quite uh, stark between the performance of this and a tube solution. Okay, what's the advantages of a tube solution? It's a higher solar yield, it's 30% more effective, and ultimately for, for you, it gives us better BEO results. Very, very, very little thermal loss. That's because of the integrity of the vacuum. As the tube seal, we can, you can't get dirt and moisture into it. It works in cold and windy conditions, so it's not really affected by heat. It's more irradiated light. The tubes can be rotated, so within the system, you can actually rotate within the manifold the tube towards the best orientation. On a flat plate, you can't. The flat plate sits flush in the roof, and that's it. And higher temperatures can be achieved. Particularly, and that's very, very suitable in the summer. You could, it can really perform at a very high level in the summer, and it can, it can retain the heat. What's the advantage? Is it does cost more. Absolutely, it costs more. And it's not easy integrated into the fabric of the building, so it sits on roof. It's on roof, it never gets integrated into the roof. Okay, so aesthetically, it's not as good. Absolutely, and we would recognise that. But again, it's really the question is here is, is, what, is it, as, what does your client want? And what are you trying to design? Okay, how can you build it? How can you mount it on the roof? Okay, <clears throat> so the flat pit and the heat pipe tubes require a minimum pitch of 25 degrees. The direct flow can be installed any way you want, but there are, uh, there are certain disadvantages to direct flow. We would find direct flow systems tend to be put more on industrial commercial buildings, and a heat pipe solution tends to be put on domestic solutions. Okay, so you can see just a graphic there on all the different places you can put the product. But remember, you don't have to have the pitched roof, as I said, and you don't have to have it south facing. Hard L. Okay, what's well, the key thing here is, is part of L. You want to, we believe you want to work on, with suppliers who can find a full design service. We can give a full design service, we can give you the deep calculation, we can tell you what you need to do. In, in, in terms of complying with it. We have a significant experience in the calculations, as I said, very significant experience, and we can supply product data, data in whichever format that you want for you or for any of your other uh, uh, professionals that will give you certification on what we have designed, and we will give indemnity upon what we design. We will stand by our design. If, as long as we have the correct inputs, we will stand by our design. Okay, what can we do for you in terms of uh, service and support? We can design the product, we will give you full design and compliance support. We understand the regulations. We will give you a full proposal review. We will deliver it. We will install it. Oh, sorry, we will give installation support we don't install. And if you want a service to maintain, we can do that too. Kingspan obviously is a very, very well known Irish company and we won't walk away from anything. Absolutely, we will not walk away from anything. But what we find is that people sometimes only use parts of the service and we lose a little bit of control within the middle. So you tend to find, for example, as I said earlier, we're finding people are putting in wrong size uh, cylinders. 
and that's a problem. That's absolutely a problem. People think a cylinder is a cylinder. It's not. It's got to be sized towards the, the collector. Well, thank you.